Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents. And now your host, Paul Leslie. We've got Jeff Pike in the studio. The third girl watcher. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Jeff. Last time you were on hey, here Paul. talking about A1A, and now you're going to talk about your solo music. I'm hip to that. What you want to talk about? Well, a lot of people aren't even aware that aside from A1A, you have your original compositions. I would not be too surprised uh, in that, since A1A is what it is, and and it wasn't until, I guess, a couple of years ago we actually started doing original music in A1A. So, uh, But the music that I've written and released for many, many years is not really what you would call islandy or parrothead music. It was more along the, the lines of, I guess, a soft rock a little R and B, a little '80s retro, acoustic James Taylor, Dan Fogelberg influence, kind of things like that. The later stuff with a little more, a little more edge to it. But uh, yeah, my first album came out in '91, back when I was uh, just forming A1A. It wasn't intentional, but Scott and I were just playing and getting together, and he actually wrote a song with me on the first album called Waiting for the Fire. And we were getting ready to actually put a band together to promote that CD and push it when the doors opened for A1A in 92, and then things kind of like just got pushed aside. And uh, years went by with the success of A1A, and it kind of got put on the back burner, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I never quit writing and a recording I here in my studio. And released a couple other things, and I've got a lot yet to release. But uh, in case anyone's interested, you can listen to it all on my website, and you can buy it there as well at jeffpike.com. So uh, make it a regular stop on your regular business day. So uh, that's a start for things. <laughs> the first album, Waiting for the Fire, is one of my favorite albums. You told me, and that means a lot to me. And I thank you a lot, Paul. I appreciate that. I'm quite fond of it myself. And when we first met, we were talking about our love of music and some of the music we loved. And uh, what would you describe as, as some of the sounds that you would hear in Waiting for the Fire and the other albums and some of your musical influences? Well, the influence part is really vast because, like, I guess you'd have to, like, narrow it down. Like, I've got so many musical influences that I love and I just worship and make a part of who I am, but as far as... There's influences that make up what's on my music. The songs that I write are probably a little more more concise. Like I could sit here and and give you Jim Buffett and James Taylor, and as far as Alice Cooper and Deep Purple and the Tubes and Kiss and Queen and then Lizzie and Barry Manilow and Julio Iglesias. You're, <laughs> but you're not going to hear all that on my solo records. To answer your first question, Waiting for the Fire, which my first album came out, uh, was very keyboard heavy in the 80s. I was a big keyboard player in the 80s, and it's kind of like, I would say, a cross between, I don't know, Christopher Cross, Richard Marks, late 80s, Toto kind of things like that, uh, more middle of the road, Dan Fogelberg things, James Taylor a bit. Oh, here's a good one. I was compared to Ario Speedwagon and Sticks in a local uh, newspaper <laughs> interview that came out in 89. A favorable interview, I might say, or read. Review, excuse me, but um, yes, I would say that was the first album. And the second album, which came out a few years later, uh, was compared to like uh, The Tubes and Toto and Sticks and Alan Parsons Project and Daryl Hall. And um, and my third album uh, was all acoustic, and then that was purely like just a Dan Fogelberg, Kenny Loggins kind of kind of atmosphere on my solo music. I've got a lot, like I said, I've been recording and writing for a long time outside of A1A when I have any time to breathe, which is rare these days. But uh, I plan on releasing another album, hopefully, this year, 2005. Hmm. And there's uh, three total of your original albums. Let me think. Four, counting the one I did with my friend Ken. Ah. Let Go, but that's kind of a, a another project all of its own. But yeah, three or four albums. And with about ten of them in the can. <laughs> <laughs> so Waiting for the Fire was the first one. Uh, the other side came out in 2000. I had Live at the Red Light Cafe in, I think, 2001. Uh, Ken and I did Let Go in 2001. I released uh, one called the Jet Pike Studio Sessions in 2003, which is uh, a lot of old studio stuff I did with other artists in Atlanta for uh, about 20 years of my life. It's kind of a little time capsule there, which is pretty cool, too. But I'm working on uh, the next one, which should be out, hopefully, in 2005, called On Down the Line. It's been in the works for a long time, and I'm just now getting down some time to put away and, and, and put it to bed. 
along with the new A1A record as well. And there's one song that, uh, for some Jimmy Buffett fans, there's a connection there from uh, the other side. Yes, that's the one I wanted to talk about. Um, even though if you listen to it, it's not Parrot Heady at all. It's kind of a, uh, a mm, probably an Alan Parsons kind of kind of R and B Daryl Hall kind of song, but it was actually inspired and actually written for two old good Parrot Head friends of mine uh, who I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, back in the mid '90s, my friend Whit Proctor, uh, who was the president, I believe, of the Raleigh, North Carolina Parrot Head Club at the time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was getting married, and he and I and along with Scott, were great friends. And his uh, fiance, Danny, contacted me and wanted me to wanted to commission me to write a song for them for her to give to Wit for their wedding gift. And so what she wanted me to do was to write a song that conveyed like all the aspects of how they met, their love, their life, just little parts, bits and pieces of their life to fit into a song that leads up to where they got married. And I told her I'd do it. And like, I always have 5,000 things on my plate. I think I finally told her this, <laughs> but a lot of time went by and the deadline came up and I was like really under the gun. And, uh, I remember I was uh, seeing this girl at the time. I said, I can't see you this weekend because I've got to write a song and record it and get it in the mail by Sunday afternoon. She went, ha, you'll never do it. I said, watch me. So I went home and I, I wrote, recorded, and produced, and mastered, and finished the entire song in less than a day and a half and got it in the mail, but it didn't get there in time. It got the day after, so I felt really bad about it. But it was a very cool and uh, inspired song. It was called, uh, what was it called? Through the Sands of Time. It was for Witt and Danny Proctor, who aren't very active in the, I don't, in the Parrothead clubs anymore, I don't believe. But uh, that was a cool story, one of the songs that I did for the one of my original albums, which we'll play a little bit later on if you'd like to. All right. Um, there's one other song that's from the first album, Waiting for the Fire, and it is my favorite of your songs. I actually think that that album should have been called Young Hearts. Thank you, Paul. You have good taste because that was always one of my favorite songs too. Probably the favorite song of mine off that record and one that I'd written. I listen to that album now like most artists. You go back and listen to things did a long time ago. And I wish I could have done a lot of things different, added some things, taken away some things. I wouldn't mind going back and re-recording the entire album again. But there's not a lot of time left, so why waste it? It is what it is, and I'm proud of it. I'm glad you liked it too. So what's that song about? You know what? It was so long, I actually, I'm not sure if you even know this or not, but I actually wrote that song for a female singer that I had just gotten back in touch with from high school, and she was looking to do some demo work, and I was, and she needed some songs. And so I sat and wrote her two or three songs, three or four or three she used, and I wrote that one, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to give this one to her. I'm going to keep this for myself. And, um... Uh, and ever since I did that and recorded it, every time I listen to it, I hear something else that's happened in my life in the past, to the present, and maybe even the future. That is very close to how I feel. It's just a song about love and betrayal and hardships and just the knocks of life and, and growing up, loss of innocence, the things a lot of good classic songs are made of. I'm not saying mine's a classic, but I just kind of, kind of put all those in there. It's a very emotional song for me. I'm a, I'm the kind of songwriter. I don't have a lot of songs out because I'm very very picky and I'm very hard on what I release. I don't want to put out a lot of music that's just out there. I think Rain said the same thing in one of his interviews we did, to, did with him recently. I like my songs to count, and I like to be really proud of my songs, and uh, I want them to mean something to people. I've had a lot of people over the years come to me and say, "You know what? This song on this record, this got me through some really tough times." I had that happen a lot of times, and this song here means so much to me. And I played this for so and so, and we were having a fight, and it made things all better. Or I got through this because I was having problems with my parents, and I want to thank you for writing that song. That is so cool. To me, that means more than a, a million dollars could to me. But I wouldn't mind a million bucks. If anybody wants to <laughs> say, you know what, I'll, here's the words of the cash. I'll take the cash. Wasn't that the motto with today's show? Where's the cash? That was Through the Sands of Time with today's special guest, Jeff Pike. Yes, I'm here, Paul. I'm back. That was for Wit and Danny Proctor. Hope you guys are listening. And aside from the two studio albums, there is a live album which has been very well received. Yes, that was done in 2001 with my uh, partner, Coney Farrell who has uh, been an A1A for the past few years, and co-wrote Chip Happens with us, by the way. And uh, Conan and I played for 
20 years off and on. And uh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, we were doing a, an acoustic show of our own original music, kind of unplugged versions of our original songs, just me on guitar and Coney on eight-string bass, sometimes five-string bass, sometimes six-string bass, sometimes a man will be used with the bass guitar. And um, so we decided to get a, a good recording of our show live. And uh, the best place to do that in Atlanta, Georgia, is a place called the Red Light Cafe downtown. It's a very small and eclectic listening room uh, that hosts a wide variety of performers and musical genres, uh, prominently acoustic. And so we had a, a show there one night, and uh, just for rehearsal's sake, we recorded the show. Uh, it was never meant to be a record at all. It was meant just to be a, a recording of our show to listen to, to work on, and just to rehearse to, basically. So uh, we just put a two-track DAT machine up to the sound console and did our show and uh, had a couple of glasses of wine and went home. Uh, next day, uh, put the tape into the studio, pushed play, and went, whoa, that sounds too good to be true. And everything it was one of those rare occasions when everything was absolutely perfect. I mean, the levels, the sound, the performance, everything was like perfect. And I don't know why. I, I'm sure I couldn't do it again. And um, so we listened to it over and over again. And everybody said that heard it said that needs to be a record. And I said, well, it wasn't really meant to be one, but because there's some songs on there that were already released on Waiting for the Fire, you know, and there's mostly new songs, but a few that have been recorded. And then the other side as well. But uh, long story short, we uh, said, okay, I'll do it. So I chopped it down, edited it up, made it nice and pristine, and uh, put it out. And uh, people loved it. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of stock right now as we speak. i got to get some more printed. People love that CD. They say it's really nice and, and laid back, uh, kind of like Kenny Loggins, James Taylor, Dan Fogelberg, uh, along those kind of lines. That, uh, mm. I'm quite proud of that. There's some there's some good stuff on there. That was a very, very good night. One of those nights when you're playing and you're really into it so much and you go, man, this is, it might not sound good on tape, but it sure sounds good on stage. And it was a very nice night. We both played well that night. And there's a couple songs on there that um, aren't on the two, two studio albums. Yes, that's what I was saying earlier. There was a, I think there's three, I believe. I think there was Cosmic Chestnut Mare and Good Morning Alabama. And on down the line, three that I wrote with my old drinking buddy and songwriting buddy, Bush Peebles, who a, was a huge parrot head. His claim to fame uh, well, has many, but one of his best ones was his grandmother used to actually babysit Jimmy Buffett. And uh, that's no lie. She really did. So that hmm. was, yeah, and their, his whole family is from where Jimmy's family grew up, and they were really well to do, and they knew each other. And so that was his um, claim to fame back when he was a big parrot head. Now he's settled down, kids, big job. Big Belly, Scott Stringer, <laughs> doing just, I'm just kidding, but giving you a hard time. But yeah, we'd actually worked on a record of our own music for a, for a long time, and I have several songs in the making to work on our, that we're hoping to release in the future. Oh, as a matter of fact, we had a few songs on the Ship Happens CD. Bush and I wrote Right Kind of Day, and we might have had one more we did, but yeah, Moonlit Island Night was a Bush Peoples and Jet Pike song, actually, hmm. if you look closely. So, uh, yeah, we did those. Those three weren't released anywhere else, but there were a few more that were on Waiting for the Fire on the other side. There were completely different arrangements, of course, and so it made the album with a more low-key flavor. But those songs I just mentioned will be in full track versions of my next release, hopefully, sometime in late 2005. And there's one song on there that's been compared kind of to like a, a Mac McAnally song, kind of a the old kind of Jimmy Buffett acoustic sound, and it's called Good Morning Alabama. Yes, Good Morning Alabama, and I actually have that, and I sure wish Mac would record that. <laughs> Mac, you out there? I would love for you to record my song. He could do it justice, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm quite proud of that song. Bush and I wrote that. Uh, Bush is from Mobile, Alabama, and his lyrics are really introspective, and that song is about growing up, uh, realizing your dreams, and having the, the strength to uh, test fate, even though you're frightened, to go out into the world and then chase your dreams. Knowing whether what it may not, not come true, just testing along and pushing the waters, and it's a great song about coming of age, and the loss of innocence once again. Then uh, it's a great song in my opinion, and I love. I've always loved performing that song uh, to this day, and it'll be on my the next record as well as a full band version. But the one on the Light Cafe, of course, is acoustic and unplugged, and uh, very subdued. But I've gotten a lot of good comments on it from Parrotheads. Jeff, thanks for coming on today. 
Paul, thank you very much for letting me share this side of my musical personality with those who weren't aware that it even existed. Like it or not, I'm here to stay. Tomorrow belongs to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we I have hope. to say, without uh, your knowledge on music... And uh, the fact that we love so many different kinds of music and we each turn each other on to new stuff, it's uh, it's made time after all the time a lot better. Every time I do a show on my own, it's never nearly as much fun, and I've noticed it's not as good of a show. Thank you, Paul. That means a lot, and I really appreciate it, and I, my sentiments are exactly the same. The camaraderie, the way we bounce ideas off each other and picking out songs works well. Speaking of picking out songs, it's almost time for the Jeff Pike pick, is it not? I think so. Why don't you make your selection? I have made my selection, and I've made it wisely. I'm going to play for you today a Billy Joel song from my all-time... Root Beer Rag? Huh? No. I mean, I like it. You know what? That's a good call. Let me shovel you know through my CDs here and, and see if I have... <laughs> well, what do you know? I do have that. That's a good call. That calls for a toast. Let me get my root beer. Hold on. Good old root beer. So here's a tribute toast with root beer in hand to you and the many mugs of suds along your happy trails. Thank you, Cheers. Mr. Paul. Here's to it. Here's to another year of Tate. And here's to many, many more fine glasses of root beer along the way.